Hi folks, welcome to this video on bonds issued at par between interest payment dates. This means that the bond date and the issue date are different. So now, let's look at this example to see how uh, when the bond date and the issue date are different for a par value bond, what impact that has on our journal entries. So we have Barnes Company who's issuing the bonds to investors. To issue a bond means to sell it, okay? They're going to pay investors 9% interest over a 20-year period, and the par value of the bond is 800000 The bond is dated January 1st. Interest is paid twice a year, June 30th and December 31st. And the bond, uh, the maturity date, because it's a 20-year bond, is going to be January 1st, 2034. So now you see here that even though the bond is dated January 1st, that means when it's available to be sold, the investors didn't buy it until March the 1st. So we have to think of a couple of rules here that are going to help us record the bond. The first rule we have to work with is that Whoever holds the bonds at the interest payment date, that's June the 30th, 2014, is going to receive the full six months of interest. So the investors have to pay Barnes for the privilege of getting a full six months of interest at June 30th, even though they've only held the bonds for four months. The four-month period is from March the 1st to June 30th. So the investors have to pay up front for the first two months of six, which is January 1st to March 1st. So that's January and February. So when we use our rules here, our entries are going to be what? At the issue date, we're going to debit cash for 812000 we're going to credit the bond payable because don't forget we're doing Barnes's books and they have to pay back the issuer or the investor 800000 And then we have to record interest payable. So you're probably wondering where these amounts come from. We can explain that. The interest payable that you see here for 12000 represents the interest that the investors are paying Barnes up front for these two months, January and February, from January 1st to March 1st. So that's two months, right? So how much interest are they going to pay them up front? On $800,000 at 9% a year, but we want to prorate it for only two months, January and February. So that interest payable is $12,000. But how much do the investors pay Barnes? The cash received by Barnes, who's the issuer, is the face value, right, plus the interest payable. That's $812,000. So what does that mean? That means that the investors have given Barnes $800,000 face value plus the two months interest up front, which is $12,000. And Barnes had to record an interest or bond liability of $800,000 and an interest liability of $12,000. do not forget, this $12,000 will be paid back to the investors on June the 30th when the full six-month interest payment is made. So now, what does our journal entry look like on June the 30th? Don't forget, we our rule said that on June the 30th, we're going to pay them a full six months interest, even though they've only been in the game for four months. So we're going to pay them 36000 That's 800000 times the coupon rate of 9%. And don't forget, your rates, unless they tell you otherwise, are always annual rates. So this 9% is for the year, but we only want it for six months, up to June 30th, right? And that's going to give us 36000 And that's the amount of cash we have here. But now, what do we notice? We notice that we also have to book interest expense. Why? Well, because, don't forget, the bond was issued by Barnes to its investors on March the 1st. So from March 1st to June 30th, that's four months. For that four months, don't forget, once the bond is outstanding, once it's issued, once we have debt, we have to record interest on that debt. 
I don't know of anywhere where you can go and borrow money, and once you get the money, just like Barnes got the money from its investors, you don't have to pay interest. You always have to pay interest when you're borrowing money. So in this case, we're going to have to record, if we're Barnes, the interest expense. And that's 800000 at 9%, but only for four months of 12. That four months is from March all the way to June. Now, if we're paying out $36,000 to our investors and we're booking interest expense of $24,000, you can see we're a little light on the debit side. That's because part of this 36000 that we're get paying the investors is for six months. But we also have to pay them back as part of that $36,000 payment, the 12000 that they gave us up front, right? Notice here that there's no need at the bond date. That's the date the bonds are dated, which is January 1st, 2014. We don't make a journal entry then because that's the date the bond became available for sale but that's not the date it was issued. So you notice here, I never asked you to make an entry on January 1st. There was no entry. Why? Because the bond wasn't issued then. It's only once the bond is issued that we have to make an entry on the issue date and we also have to make entries to record interest. So we've recorded our first interest payment. We now have to make an interest payment on December 31st. And what does that look like? Well, now if you look back at your timeline, we've got interest after June 30th, so from July the 1st all the way to December 31st. That's a full six months. So you notice we have a straight six month period with no issues or no worries. We don't have to allocate any two months like we did up here. We're only calculating straight interest that we're going to pay out to the investor for six months. And again, to Barnes, they have to book interest expense on that. So all we do is debit interest expense and credit cash. Now, let's look at a second example. Let's assume in our second example here, Barnes issues a 9% 20-year $800,000 bond at par. The date, is, the date the bonds are dated is the same. Maturity date's the same. Semi-annual interest, the same as our first example. But now instead of Barnes issuing the bonds on March the 1st, as we said before, we're changing the date just to give you a little bit more practice. What if the bond is sold by the issuer, Barnes, to its investors on February the 1st, 2014? Remember our rules. Whoever holds those bonds is going to get a full six months interest from January 1st to June 30th. But in order to get the full six month interest payment, because they only bought in February 1st, which is five months from February 1st to June 30th, they have to pay one month's interest up front. So this means that investors have to pay Barnes for the privilege of getting a full six months of interest at June 30th, even though they only held the bonds for five months. That's from February 1 to June 30th. And again, interest expense is only going to be started to be booked by Barnes once the bonds are issued. And in our case now, in the second example, that's February 1st. So if we have a look at our entry, at the issue date, which is February 1st, now Barnes receives 806000 Where does that extra 6000 come from? Well, again, it represents interest payable. So that 6000 right here, that's part of this number, represents interest payable. How did we get that? Well, the interest payable is down here in this line. It's your face value times your coupon but now we're only accruing the interest for one month. That's the month of January. So from January 1st to February 1st, that's one month. And that's 6000 So the issuer is going to receive not only the $800,000 face value, but they're also going to receive the advanced interest payment that they got from the investors. The issuer Barnes is also going to book their bond payable of 800000 that's the amount at the end of 20 years that Barnes is going to have to pay back to investors. 
So now we've made our entry at the issue date. So now what happens on June the 30th? Well, on June the 30th, very similar to what we saw in example one, Barnes is going to pay out a full six months of interest, right? A full six months. So the interest owed is going to be a full six months. That's 36000 Barnes is paying that to their investors. Part of that 36000 includes the 6000 that the investors gave them up front, okay, that they're now paying back. So that 6000 is part of this $36,000 payment. So now the only other thing we have to book here is the interest expense. And the interest expense we're booking from February 1st to June 1st because February 1st was the date the bonds were issued. So we only book interest expense after the bonds have been issued. So we have to wait for the period and at the end of the period, that's the interest payment date, we're going to book our interest expense but only for five months and that five months is 30000 Now notice again that no entry is needed at the bond date, that's January 1st, 2014, since that's the date that the bond is available for sale. It's not the issue date. We don't need to make any journal entries before the issue date for the bond. We only start, we only have to make a journal entry at the issue date and for any subsequent interest expense that we need to book. So we've gone through a couple of examples now. We're going to take a little bit of a breather and then we'll come back and we'll finish the rest of our third example and then move on to a new topic. So I hope you found the video helpful.